Get after it. Not only is today our first Fresh Start Sunday of 2023, word is we have 16 baptisms, which mind blown right there. So that, that's sensational news. But today is also a really big day concerning the series that we've been in since the beginning of January called Do the Work, where we've been talking about some of the spiritual disciplines. We've been taking a journey down the road of spiritual formation, and we've been learning and implementing some of the practices and disciplines that Christians have been engaging with for thousands of years now to become more deeply formed in Jesus. And as always, I want to offer you this reminder. Your salvation is not contingent upon any of these spiritual disciplines. You were saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God. Nothing you can do. But your salvation is, or your, uh, your, your spiritual maturity is contingent upon these disciplines. Your spiritual growth is contingent upon these disciplines. And so as a reminder, so far, we've talked about feasting and fasting, reading and praying, community and confession, silence and solitude, and with Valentine's Day weekend quickly approaching, today we talk about our first solo discipline of the series, something that I'm going to be referring to as superb sex. And that'll actually be our title for today's message, superb sex. Sex. And uh, let me offer you another reminder. Today's message is not going to be a quick fix for your healthy or broken marriage. Okay, there are a lot of other resources that you're going to have to use if that's where you're at right now. There are books, there are teachings, there are uh, counseling and therapy agencies that are going to be good for that. In fact, next year, we are going to have an entire series, very likely dedicated to the topics of dating and relationships and marriage and stuff like that. Uh, and we'll give you guys resources throughout the week, like books and stuff that you can check out that are going to be helpful for you. Um, but as we've talked about last week and as we've done our due diligence to try to remind you concerning uh, via social media, today we are primarily going to be talking about the subject of sex, healthy, beautiful, holy sex within the confines of marriage between one biological man and one biological woman. Next week, we're going to be talking about purity, and I just want to say that men, especially men in the room, if you're here this week, disregard everything I say if you don't plan on showing up for next week, okay? So next week, we are talking about purity and chastity, but today, we're going to be talking about the subject of sex, and uh, within our conversation, and let me say this, I know that there's no way that I'm going to be able to communicate every single necessary topic of discussion today. There's no way I'm going to be able to do that. So check out some of the resources that we make available to you guys. Uh, but whether you are married currently or you plan on being married, let me say this. You need this message. And, and I need one thing from you today. And this is it. All right. Don't stand up during the middle of this message and go get a drink of water because you're you know, you're full of anxiety or you're uncomfortable. Don't stand up. This is not the day to stand up and go to the bathroom. Don't walk in front of here. Don't walk out that side door. Don't walk out the back door. If you can sit through Avatar the entire time without getting up to go to the bathroom, you can sit through a sermon without doing it. So stay in your seat. Get real comfortable. Uh, it's going to be a fun and bumpy and probably uncomfortable ride for some of you, but it is going to be enjoyable by the time we get to the end. I can promise you that. So I appreciate you in advance. For not getting up and walking out because you need to hear this. Uh, and so with that being said, the best starting point that we're going to have is we're going to have to start at the very beginning, the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And we've got to start in the first two chapters of the first book of the Bible. Because when you start reading, what you find out in Genesis 1 and 2 is that in the first five days of creation, God essentially creates almost everything in the universe. And then on day five, he creates Adam. He creates a man, a human for the first time. And he immediately puts Adam to work. He starts, he gives Adam the job of naming all the animals. And as soon as Adam has done that, as soon as he's done his work, God then uh, really, really, in my firm opinion, it's like he steps it up a notch and he does something that no one saw coming. And for the very first time, he creates the first of the most beautiful creatures that have ever existed. He creates a woman. And so let's read about it real quick. Genesis 2 says this. Genesis 2, starting in verse 21. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up or closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And the moment 
that Adam sees Eve for the first time, just like the moment some of you saw your wives for the first time, just like the moment you saw her for the first time on your wedding day or maybe for the first time on your honeymoon. Adam looks at Eve and he echoes prophetically the Etta James song that is now popular, way before it was popular. He says, at last, my love has come along. He said, my lonely days are over. And, and I know, thanks for putting up with the singing. That's awful. Uh, but he literally sings it. Check it out. Verse. <laughs> thank you for that round of applause. Verse 23, then the man said, at last, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Or in other words, whoa, I like that one, Lord. The, everything else that you made, like that's nice, but sh I'm keeping her. Like this, she, thank you. You did a really good job here. And then keep looking at verse 24. It says, therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And that phrase, one flesh, though it's important and it means a lot of different things, on a very practical note, when it says they shall become one flesh, it means they shall have sex. Holy, beautiful, superb sex as husband and his wife. And you get to verse number 25, which is gonna be huge for next week. It says, and the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. And every married person in the room said, amen. 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 Now, I've always thought it was strange that Christians find the topic of sex to be, a, to, to be awkward and to be a weird thing to talk about at church because not only does every single person in this room likely crave a healthy and vibrant sex life, either publicly or secretly, but not only do we all kind of crave that, but the Bible actually has a lot to say about the subject of sex and not just about how it's dangerous. Sure, we have a lot of boundaries and a lot of restrictions, and we're gonna talk about that stuff next week, but through the writers of scripture, God also has a lot to say about how sex is very good. He has a lot of good things to say about sex, and he wastes no time saying it. In the first two chapters of the Bible, God comes out the gate swinging. I mean, right there in Genesis 2, we see what he has to say about it, but if you rewind and you go back to Genesis chapter number one, you will read, that the first commandment that humanity was ever given was to go forth and multiply, a.k.a. go forth and have sex. And he says, fill the earth, meaning have lots of sex. And this is how then God himself talks about this subject. He puts his stamp of approval on it, and he says this, Genesis 1.31. He says, and God saw everything that he made, which would include sex, because the devil did not create sex and people did not create sex. God created sex. It says he saw everything that he'd made and behold, it was very, what's that word? It was very good. You see that? It was very good. And I think it's important that we note that because sex is not inherently an evil thing. Sex actually, from the beginning, is inherently a good thing. And sadly, over the course of history, the church has done a really pathetic job at teaching people that stuff. And that's why you and me and everybody else in this room grew up with skewed and warped ideas about the subject of sex, because I don't think we were ever taught that sex is a good thing. It's like this weird thing happened in the Western civil, like especially in the Western church, this divide took place where, where, where like religion got to keep God and chastity and purity, and the whole rest of the world got to keep passion and sexuality. And I think that's a bummer, because contrary to what you may have been taught growing up, if God created sex, then it is a very good thing. Now, that's not to say that humans haven't perverted sex. We viewed sex at the wrong time, in bad ways, and for evil purposes, but the same can be said about food. We've used food wrongly, we've abused food, but no one's fighting to try and say that food is inherently evil. I think we all understand that when used correctly and within the right boundaries and appropriately, food is inherently good and we should be thinking the same thing about sex. So it's time for some of you to wash and scrub your minds of that dust and rust of religion and get on the same page concerning sex in that it is a very 
good gift from God. And it's not just good when it's used for procreation. There were early church fathers that used to say stuff like this. Origen, Calvin, Augustine. They would tell people that sex was, was good and it was beneficial when it comes time to make babies. But if you're not trying to make a baby, then you should abstain from sexual relationships because it dulls your spiritual senses. And as much as those guys brought good to the table for the church concerning theology and doctrine, myself and a whole lot of other people would disagree with them on this topic about how sex should be abstained from and that it's kind of bad if you're not trying to make babies. And that's namely because of this book that we hold kind of near and dear to our hearts called uh, The Bible. Like, they studied it. It so it blows my mind that they come to these conclusions because I don't know if you guys have ever read it. Did you know that there is an entire book of the Bible dedicated to healthy, thriving, and superb sex between a married man and a married woman. It's called the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. Practically, it is God's wisdom for us pertaining to romantic relationships and sex between a married couple. And spiritually, for those of you who are mature enough and you have the ears to hear this kind of thing, spiritually, the Song of Songs uh, is also about, it also uses the intimacy of sexual intercourse between a man and a woman to describe the intimacy and love that Jesus has for his church. And that, that's why I would fight tooth and nail to say that for married people, for married, let me pause there. If you're single in the room or if you're single forever, know this, you're not missing out on God because you're not married. You're not missing out on more of God because you're not married. Let me remind you, Jesus was single. He was never married and he never had sex. He lived a life of perfect chastity forever and he did not miss out on anything, all right? He was God, so he can't, he can't be missing out on aspects of God when you are God. And so if you're single, that's the case for you. But if you are married, for all the heterosexual married Christians in the room, I believe that healthy, enjoyable, and superb sex isn't just an added bonus. I believe that for you, it's an added spiritual discipline. And that's because if you aren't having healthy, enjoyable, and superb sex, your marriage is suffering. Whether you would care to admit it or not, whether you've ever had the conversation, whether you're man enough or woman enough to have that conversation, your marriage is suffering. And if you're not fighting to have a good and healthy marriage, if you're not fighting for that, then you are missing out on certain aspects of God because God loves sex. And I know it gets real quiet. It got quiet at 8 a.m. when I said that because people was like, can you say that? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I'm not saying God loves having sex. Jesus didn't have sex. I'm saying God created sex and he calls it very good which means that God loves sex, and if you're married, you should love sex as well. You should love having sex with your spouse. But understandably, there are a lot of roadblocks as it comes to uh, having a superb sex life with your spouse. And contrary to what some of you husbands are thinking right now, the only roadblock is not your wife's lack of interest in having sex with you. Because I know you're thinking, it. you're like, I, I know a roadblock, it's her. Like, you know, <laughs> she's the roadblock. That is not true, namely because that's not even always the case. There are many women who have higher libidos than their husbands. So up front, ladies, just know this message is not specifically aimed at you today. And you can put your guard down. You're in a safe place. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be coming after women today, but just know, husbands, this message is not just aimed at you either. I'm attacking all of you today. I'm coming after everybody in this room. So put your seatbelt on, buckle up, because it's gonna be a bumpy ride. And on that ride, um, we're gonna talk about three primary motifs today. And those are gonna be communication, intentionality, and patience. There's gonna be a lot of subtopics under all those, but if you master the subtopics that we're gonna talk about under communication, intentionality, and patience, you will find yourself well on your way to having a superb sex life. And again, let me know, I can't possibly talk about every piece of important conversation that needs to be said about this subject today. And there are lots of resources out there that can help with that. And we're going to do our diligence to make that available for you this week. And all I'm going to do right now is give you a handful of starting points to just kind of really get the ball rolling on your, on your superb sex life. And so number one, the first motif is that we got to talk about communication in the same way 
that prayer, which is communication with God, is essential if you ever want to experience a healthy and thriving relationship with the, with the Lord. Well, guess what? Communication is also essential if you ever want to experience a healthy and thriving relationship with your spouse that results in healthy, thriving, and superb sex life. And when I say communication, I'm not just talking about you sharing your sexual needs and desires and preferences with each other, though that is a big deal, and we'll talk about that soon. But first, what I'm talking about when I say communication is number one, and this is subtopic number one under communication for those of you that are taking notes. Number one is this thing that we'll just call general communication. General communication. It does not matter the difference in your schedules, uh, how one person works thirds and one person works first, and the difference of your responsibilities. You should be engaging in meaningful conversation with your spouse every day. If you have seven kids, you should be engaging in meaningful conversation with your spouse every day. If you work long hours, you should be having those conversations every single day. You should be catching each other up on the happenings of your life. What happened at work? How is this person doing? How's this friend? Well, what happened in your day? Talk to me about it. What you're going through, what you're feeling. You should be having conversations like that. When something changes in your schedule, don't forget to tell your spouse. And then last second, go, oh, so sorry. There's a birthday party tonight at five o'clock and they weren't planning on it. I can't tell you how many fights we've gotten in just because we didn't communicate something as small as a change of schedule. You should be talking about that. Guess what else you should be talking about? Money. I know y'all are like, oh, don't talk to me about that. You should be talking about money. If you make a purchase over $50, or over $100, y'all should be communicating about that because the moment you got married, it quit being your money. According to God, you are one flesh, which means that you have one bank account. That's not your money. It's not her money. It's not his money. It's y'all's money. That means y'all should be a team. Y'all should be talking about stuff like that. Man, if you have a great moment and uh, there's a victory that happens that day, you should be texting your spouse or calling them and telling them about it. Why? So they can celebrate with you. And then when they do call you to celebrate, celebrate. Don't be like, great, man, it's awesome. We gotta get back to work. No, give them two minutes and celebrate with them. If you're having a bad day, you should be able to reach out to the person that you claim to love more than anybody else in the world and ask them to pray for you. Y'all should be having regular general communication. And when you are, when you are, as it goes with conversation, remember this, stop assuming anything. Don't assume anything. Don't assume that you know what their reaction's gonna be. Don't assume that you know what their thought process is gonna be. Don't assume that you know what they meant when they really said this, but I, I know what you really meant is that. You can't assume that stuff because you don't know any of that. What, what your only goal is to keep an open line of communication, popping between you guys 24 seven. You guys, you gotta fight to stay buddies. You gotta fight to stay best friends. Some of you turned into roommates a couple years after you had kids. You turned into just co-parents, and that's not the goal. You got to fight to be friends. That's, think about it. That's how it was early in your relationship. If you went one day without hanging out with each other, you're calling each other on the phone, talking about your day. You're, you're texting each other throughout the day. You're going to the bathroom at work real quick to respond and send emojis and send risky pictures and all that different stuff. Like, at work, I know, I know, I've been there, I've been married. You're doing that different stuff. And you know what else happened at the beginning of your relationship? Better sex, because you mastered the art of general communication. So number one, general communication. Number two, you gotta talk about what's happening in here, okay? Your spouse, and I know y'all know this because you say it to each other all the time, your spouse cannot read your mind. He for sure can't read your mind. <laughs> it's gonna let you know. She's better at it. I can, in most cases, she's better at it. He he cannot read your mind. Your spouse cannot read your mind. And so this is what happens. When you have a bad day, whether you're the husband or the wife, when you have a bad day, you gotta quit shoving that down and coming home and acting like it's all just gonna be fine if you don't talk about it, because it's not. You know what happens? You've been there a 100 times. You don't talk about it, you shove it down. One thing happens, and you just pop off on your family. You pop off on your kids. You pop off on your wife, and it has nothing to do with them. I cannot tell you how many fights me and Sam have been in that had nothing to do with each other and everything to do with something that was going on up here, something that was concerning the week or the previous day, but because we never talked to each other about it, it just ends up blowing up on each other for no reason. You have got to do the work of learning, especially men. You gotta, you gotta act like a man, you gotta grow up. You gotta learn how to verbalize your feelings verbalize your anger, verbalize your insecurities and your stress and your anxiety. Learn how to verbalize your fears, the things that you're going through. You have to allow your spouse 
to do their job. You have to allow your spouse to step into their God-ordained purpose as your helpmate. If you refuse to get vulnerable and open up with your spouse and let them help you and let them come to your aid and let them come and comfort you and care for you, you are holding them back from their God-ordained purpose. That's your job as spouses. And then when it's your job to be the one who is listening and who's loving, do it well, okay? Do better. And what I mean by do better is when your wife or your husband is finally getting vulnerable and they're letting you in to what's going on up here, put your phone down. Quit answering text messages in the middle of your conversations. If someone calls, decline the call and don't take it. Quit looking at emails, get your remote control and turn the TV off. Quit playing with your pets. Quit washing the dishes. Sit down, hold their hands, look them in the eye and give them your full attention. This is what's called active listening. And this is so powerful that I actually, when I'm talking to couples who are dating but they're not married yet, I encourage them not to do this because when you pair active listening with vulnerability, it creates a deep emotional connection. It does. It creates a deep emotional connection. And oftentimes, between men and women, when an intense emotional connection is created, what happens? It leads to a sexual connection, for good or for bad. And so if that's the case, for good or for bad, for married couple, or for non-married couples as well, then it's extra going to be the case for married couples. You have got to learn how to grow up and let them know what is happening up here. You can't keep it to yourself. And then number three, under the topic of communication, this is where we get real, so just get ready. You guys have gotta learn how to openly share your sexual needs, preferences, wants, desires, and hangups. I want you to consider this. Does your spouse know what you're looking for sexually? Do you know what you're looking for sexually? I can't tell you. It blows my mind that couples don't have post-sex recap conversations. Like, I know, and this is where we all turn into sixth graders, and this is my favorite thing in the world, talking to adults, and everyone's like, and they're trying so hard not to laugh because you don't want to be the one laughing, but it's funny, okay? I can't believe we don't do this, though. You need to take five minutes before you get back to to real life, and you need to do play-by-play. If something happened that you like, note it. If something happened that you didn't like, change the game plan up next time. You want to know why we do this? Contrary to what you've been told, the longer you're married, you should be having better sex. The longer you're married, you should be having better sex. If it's the same concerning our walk with God, the longer you read the Bible, the better you get at reading the Bible. The longer you read the Bible, the more you enjoy reading the Bible, the more enjoyable it becomes. The, the more you pray, the better you get at prayer. The more you pray, the more you enjoy spending time in the presence of God. In the same sense, the more you're having sex, the longer you're married, the better you should be getting at having sex. But that's only gonna happen if you guys are having open-ended conversations about that kind of stuff. And honestly, I've never understood why we wouldn't be doing that. Is it because, and honestly, I think we have to say, is it because we're just afraid of negative feedback? If so, riddle me this. What's worse, hearing that you may have some room for improvement or an unfulfilling sex life for the rest of your day spent on earth. I know which one I'm picking, and it's not an unfulfilling sex life for the rest of my days on earth. So are there unmet expectations that are happening in the bedroom? You guys have to talk about that stuff. Are, are you dealing with insecurities about your body or about your past sex life? I can't tell you, man, so many times the reason that people struggle with having sex is because they feel undesirable themselves. And that's okay, that's okay. Like, you're not lesser than for feeling that way, but here's where the problem arises. You don't tell your spouse that. And so what happens is that your spouse, who sees you as totally desirable, who loves the way that you looked, who is uber attracted to you, you don't tell them that you feel that way about yourself, and so they end up thinking that you find them undesirable because you're not having sex. 
And so then that same bi-weekly argument about how we don't have sex enough, it starts all over again. If you've been married, you've had the argument and it's likely a bi-weekly thing at certain times in your marriage. It starts all over again. And when it does, let me, oh, let me give you some important information concerning your spouse that they may not be able to vocalize to you as well. When your spouse is angry about not having sex, they're not just angry about a lack of sex, they're angry because they feel overlooked, undervalued, and unloved. They're angry because they feel taken advantage of. They're angry because they feel disregarded. They feel like you don't care about them. And on some level, that might actually be the truth. They might actually have a justifiable reason to feel like that. For example, concerning whether it's your husband or your wife, they go to work, they have responsibilities, they take care of the kids, they help out with the house, they do their thing, and you expect them to do as much. And then when it comes to having sex, something they rightfully and biblically expect from you, you disregard that as a non-essential, leaving them feeling completely unappreciated and perpetually unloved. And then you have the audacity to get mad at them when they stop caring about the things that you care about, when in reality, you stopped caring about the thing that they cared about a long time ago. You stopped meeting their needs four months ago. Yeah, of course, of course they're frustrated. We have got to get better at opening up and talking about our needs and our desires and our wants and our preferences and even our hang-ups. So that, that does it for communication. Now we move on to motif number two, which is intentionality. Without superb amounts of intentionality, you will never have superb sex. And the first little subtopic under intentionality that I'm going to zoom through, but it's necessary to talk about, is Therapy. Maybe you've experienced sexual abuse of some kind in the past. Maybe you have severe body image problems. Maybe you go through anxiety, anger, depression, some form of addiction. Or maybe your marriage is so far gone that you have nowhere, like you don't even know where to start. Reach out to us and send us an email because I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm not licensed to do that. I can talk to you about the Bible all day long, but I am not licensed to help fix your marriage, okay? But there are a lot of people who are. There are a lot of people who can help, and we can point you to those people, and already I can hear your thoughts, and I want to make, let, let's just go ahead and attack them real quick, okay? Therapy is not anti-Christian, and therapy is not for uh, the weaker, less spiritual Christians, unlike yourself. I want you to go ahead and get the pretentious, self-righteous garbage out of your mind because that's not even what the Bible has to say about it. If you read the Bible, you know, so let's read it. First, uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen says this. Where there is no guidance, people fall. Marriages fall. But in an abundance of, what's that word? Counselors. Interesting word to use there, huh? Where there is no guidance, people fall. But in an abundance of counselors, their safety. Look at Proverbs 12, 15. Fools think that their own way is right. Fools think that they can handle everything on their own. But the wise are willing to listen to others. The wise are willing to do whatever it takes to give some feedback, even if that means going to therapy. And be reminded, therapy is not free. And I'm going to be up front with you right here. Our church is not going to foot the bill. If you aren't willing to make the necessary sacrifices to grow in your relationship with your spouse by spending the money on therapy, you don't actually want to grow. If you want someone else to pay for it, then you don't actually want that for your marriage, okay? And that's your prerogative, but be reminded that monthly counseling sessions are way cheaper than divorce. Amen. If you've ever gone through a divorce... Monthly counseling sessions are way cheaper than divorce. Number two, kick your kids out of the bedroom. Someone said, come on, come on, feed the sheep. Kick your kids. Now, I'm not going to stay here long because I don't have kids, but this is an epidemic. There are people who have their kids sleep in the same bed with them and they use their child as a shield to ward their spouse off for making any kind of sexual advancement. And that is sinful. That is sinful, okay? If you wanted to be just a mom or if you wanted to be just a dad, then you should have stayed single and just adopted. But you didn't. You got married, which means first and foremost, you're a spouse. 
And according to God, your spouse comes in first place and all your kids come in second place. And for those of you who have kids with someone else other than the person that you're married with right now, it is going to be tougher. I can promise you it's going to be tougher. Why? Because you went through some stuff with that kid. You, went, you may, may have endured a divorce with that kid, but unless you wanna endure another divorce with that kid, start choosing your spouse first. Put them where they belong and kick your kids out of your bedroom and get them where they belong, which is in your own bedroom or which is in their own bedroom, not your bedroom. Number three. We're gonna have some fun with this one. Fight to eliminate boredom. Fight to eliminate boredom. Anyone that's married will tell you one of the big reasons that people stop having sex is because they get bored with it. It's the whole like, okay, they're fine. We're finished, we're done. Are you satisfied? (laughs) Way of living and interacting with each other. And you know what that is? It's depressing. It's depressing. You're you're supposed to have a fun and enjoyable sex life. Again, read the Song of Songs. I read through the whole book this morning, again, just to to like get myself in the right mind frame to preach this message. Their sex is anything but boring. I can promise you. They are having a good time. They're spicing things up. They're mixing things up a little bit, and you're gonna have to do the same thing. Maybe that means move it into the living room. Maybe it means turning a light on every now and then. I'm not gonna get crude, so I'm not gonna keep going, but you guys have got to brainstorm together. You gotta get creative together on this topic. You gotta sit down, and you gotta have these conversations. Sex was intended to be exciting. It was intended to be exhilarating. It's intended to be fun, but you are gonna have to do the work of making that happen by eliminating the boredom, by having a little bit of fun. So that was, that was number three, fight to eliminate boredom. Number four, this one, we're gonna stay on this one for a little bit because I've got a lot of explaining and stuff to do. Number four, schedule your sex. I don't know that's the first time some of you have ever heard that. Schedule your sex. Years ago, when I first started hearing about people scheduling their sex, I used to think that was so lame and so rigid and downright embarrassing. And then I stayed married for five years. (laughs) And then I got older and I got a lot busier and suddenly my mind started changing on that topic a little bit. And this is why. We schedule the things that are important to us. You schedule your nail appointments. You schedule your hunting trips. You schedule your gym sessions. You schedule your prayer time. You schedule the ball games. You schedule your work. So why in the world, if God considers sex an essential, I mean, something really important, and if your spouse considers a good, superb sex life really important, why isn't it on your calendar? Because you schedule everything else that's important. Sam and I started implementing this a couple of months ago. And uh, we, we decided it, it makes the calendar for us twice a week. And one time she initiates, and the next time I initiate. And the reason I say that is because if there's only one partner in the relationship that's constantly making the first move, that is a clear sign of neglect and selfishness on your end. You both have to be initiating. And so when it's my time to initiate, I, because, I mean, newsflash, whoa, because we communicate about this stuff, I go out of my way to serve her preferences And when it's her turn, she does the exact same thing. And some of you haven't heard anything that I've just said because you're still caught up on the phrase twice a week. You're like, (laughs) what? Like, you know, there's some people in here that are like, no way. And then there's others that are like, that's a miracle, dude. (laughs) Let me say this. It's on the schedule twice a week, but we miss appointments, okay? We miss appointments, but when we do, there is always, and it's both of us, there's always one person who has to exercise forgiveness, and there's one person who has to exercise repentance. And by repentance, I don't mean a casual, I'm sorry, AKA, get over it, who cares, it's not that big of a deal. It's not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind, and it's a change of heart, and it's a change of direction. And we we do our best to exercise forgiveness and repentance. And to be honest with you, we're, we're pretty consistent. And it's not just because we're trying to conceive, it's because God himself instructs Christians to be consistent in their sex life. Check it out, 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Some of you, (laughs) some of you haven't read this verse and it is going to be apparent right now. Check it out. 
Do, speaking of sexual intercourse, this is what it says. Don't deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting, which we're in right now, in prayer. Come together again so that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. According to the Bible, if you're going to allow a lengthy amount of time to pass in between your sexual encounters, both parties must be consenting to it. Meaning that if it's just the husband that's not making sex a priority, or if it's just the wife who isn't feeling it right now for two or three weeks, or God forbid, two or three months, and the other person in the relationship is, and they have not consented to that amount of time off, then the partner who is regularly depriving your spouse from sexual intercourse, according to God, you are guilty of sexual sin. You are just as guilty of sexual sin as the person who's watching pornography. If you are depriving your spouse of sexual intercourse over a long period of time. Now that said, let's backpedal a little bit. I think it's also important to mention that it is just as wrong for one person in the marriage to demand sex every single day and then cry and whine about when you're not getting it and then attack the spouse with Bible verses or attack them with words like, well, I guess you just don't love me and I guess that you're just not submitting to me as your husband or you're not submitting to me as your wife because you know what that is? It's all, that's manipulation. And your role as as that spouse, when the other person isn't feeling it in that moment, your role is to exercise these things we call the fruits of the spirit, patience and self-control. But again, concerning the person, and I don't mean the person who's not feeling it every day, I mean the person who is regularly and consistently not wanting to have sex, let's keep in mind that there's a very fine line to that. Okay, maybe you are genuinely tired and you're frustrated and you've had a bad week or you've had a bad day. Maybe you want a night off. Maybe you want three or four days off. Maybe you want an entire week off. That's okay. That is okay. Like your spouse can learn to respect you enough for that to be the thing. But if you've got it on the calendar for twice a week, it's one thing to cancel once or twice a month. It's a whole nother thing to go three weeks without having sex and it be your fault. It's a whole nother thing to go three months without having sex and it be your fault. According to the Bible, you are in sexual sin. If you are going without sex and your spouse has not consented to that for lengthy amounts of time. And so now I guess the question is, well, what would you consider to be a lengthy amount of time? That's a good question because it's objective. For one person, it might be four hours. <laughs> For one person, it might be four days. For one person, it might be two weeks. You know, so what is the lengthy amount of time? Well, in order to answer that question, we're gonna have to go back to the verse and do this thing called contextualized reading. When Paul wrote the verse, he said that it's okay to not have sex during a, 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 a time period where you're both consenting during, when you're fasting and praying, okay? It's cool when you're fasting and praying and you've both consented to it. So, as a reminder, I know we're in the middle of a fast right now, and some of you, you're fasting like gummy worms and Sprite. Shout out. That may be, that's a great step in, in, in a good direction. Back then, when they used the word fast, they were talking about one thing. He's not eating any food at all. Zero food, and sometimes zero water. And so, Paul says, yeah, during a time period like that, if you both consent, you know, like, it's okay, like, don't, don't have sex and then come together. So, here's, I guess what I want you to consider. If we're talking about this in terms of fasting, we're not eating food, how long of a time period would you consider too long to not eat food? A couple hours? <laughs> One day? You think three days? You're probably getting there and you're going, man, I, you know, three days, some of you haven't eaten food. Everyone in your life's gonna hate you because you're mean and you're grouchy and you'll be hangry 24 seven. You, know you know what you're not saying? Two weeks. No, you know two weeks is too long to go without food for you. You're not saying three months. You're not saying six months because you know that that's too long and that's your good rule of thumb. If you wanna know how long is too long to go without sex, start thinking about how long is too long to go without food. In the same way that you would never deprave, deprive your own body from the food that it craves, you gotta stop depriving your spouse's body 
from the intimacy that they crave with you. You've gotta learn how to make this intentional. You've gotta learn how to schedule your sex. Okay, this is number five. Number five, this one's huge. This is the last one under the motif of intentionality, and it's this. Make love outside the bedroom. Make love outside the bedroom. And I don't mean like take it into the living room. We already talked about that. What I mean is exercise loving each other through your daily activities. Love each other through buying gifts and through going on dates and through sending those same risky text messages and through flirtatious comments and through uh, acts of service around the house. If she really loves when you make the bed in the morning, then stop not making the bed in the morning. What is so hard about that? If he really loves when you don't leave your dishes out, then don't leave your dishes out. Love each other. Be attentive to each other. Go out of your way to get to know each other and figure out how the other person feels love. There's an entire book called The Five Love Languages that teaches you, and it, and it teaches you how to, quote, feel each other's love tank. Because the way that you feel loved may not be the way that they feel loved. Maybe you feel loved by, by just constant affirmation and compliments, talking about how awesome you are and how perfect you are and cuddling and holding hands. Maybe they feel loved by going out to a nice dinner, spending some quality time together and having some deep conversation. You've gotta do the work of meeting each other in the middle. Making, out love, making love outside the bedroom, it means you mutually sacrificing your wants, your needs, and your desires for the other person's wants, needs, and desires. You gotta meet each other in the middle. And the Bible has a lot to say about this concerning uh, relationships between husbands and wives. Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. Meet each other in the middle. Sometimes it's your prerogative. Sometimes it's their prerogative. But submit to one another. Marriage is not a one-lane road. It's not my, my way or the highway. It is a mutual covenant between two people. Look one verse down, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you would to the Lord Jesus himself. Woo! Submit yourselves to your husbands as you would to the Lord Jesus yourself. If you think that's challenging, let's read a few verses down. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church and literally sacrificed himself for her. What? Love your wives as much as Jesus loves the church? He sacrificed his life for the church, depending on who you are, you showing love to your spouse is gonna look radically different. For some of you wives, it's gonna look like following your husband's lead sometimes, no matter how challenging that is. And for some of you husbands, it's gonna look like you acting like a man and prioritizing your wife's needs and wants and desires above your own because that's what Jesus did for the church. He put us, he, he did what he did. He gave up his own life for us. Hear me when I say this, hear me clearly. If your intention in getting married wasn't serving that person for the rest of your life, you shouldn't have been married. That's what marriage is. It's one big game of servitude. If you did not get married excited and ready to serve that person, to serve your spouse for the rest of your life in the way that they need to be served, then you should not have gotten married. And I can't say this with authority because I haven't been married that long. I've only been married for five or six years now. But I would guess that it's going to take a lifetime of effort and practice to learn how to do this. But my other guess is that it's well worth it, learning how to do this, learning how to serve each other, meet each other's needs, and be there for one another. But I can tell you this. If you're not making love outside the bedroom, you don't even deserve to be making love inside the bedroom. If you're not making love outside the bedroom, you don't deserve to be making love inside the bedroom anyways. So we've talked about communication. We've talked about intentionality, and that leads to our third and final motif. This one's, and, and we're getting ready to wrap this thing up. Our third one is patience. Patience. This is the backbone. Essentially, it is the backbone of all Christian relationships and all Christian marriage. We just read it in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for her. So how did Jesus love the church when he was here? He sacrificed his whole life for us. How does God, how does Jesus continue loving you now? Oh, he exercises radical patience with you. 
And, and, and if you don't already know that, you've missed the whole point of the gospel anyways. He exercises radical forgiveness and radical mercy even when you don't deserve it. And any marriage that is devoid of patience, enduring love and forgiveness will not continue to be a marriage for very long. You have got to learn how to exercise patience with your spouse. You've got to love them and serve them through showing them patience. And, and the reason I say this is because I do believe that everything we've talked about today is important and it could probably change your life, but I also know it's not gonna happen overnight. It's probably not, you're probably not even gonna be good at this by the end of the week and that's okay. You, you are both, you are both very imperfect and you will both fail from time to time in many different ways. You're, you're both gonna have bad attitudes and you're going to act selfishly and you're gonna fail to live up to your commitments and you're gonna have plenty of other fights. But when you do, this is what you gotta do. You gotta reframe those moments. You gotta reframe those fights because they're not the end of the world. You know what they are? They're opportunities for you to finally exercise mercy and patience and forgiveness. That's what your fights are. Your fights are not your marriage falling apart. You know every married person in here fights, probably every week, if you're healthy, because at least you're talking. When you're fighting, it's when you stop talking and you stop fighting because it's not worth it anymore. That's when you get scared. Fights aren't, aren't always bad. Fights are opportunities for you to exercise love and for you to exercise mercy and for you to exercise patience. And so when you fight, let me give you a few rules. Me and Sam have ground rules whenever we fight. You should have ground rules too. This is what I tell everyone that's about to get married. When you fight, stop leaving the house during the fight. Stop. Stop leaving the house every single time you fight and going and driving around and listening to Metallica or whatever it is that you listen to. Stop. Someone said, he just read my mind. No, I'm just. Stop leaving the house when you fight. Stop cussing at each other when you fight. Speak to each other plainly and clearly, but stop cussing at each other. Stop yelling and screaming and throwing things. Grow up. Be mature. Exercise humility for a change. Say you're sorry. Be the first to say that you're sorry. Sam's good at that. I'm awful at that, and I'm learning from her every single day. Some of you husbands need to learn from your wives. Learn how to say you're sorry. Learn how to be humble. Learn how to check your tone when you're talking with each other. Learn how to check your attitude. Stop sleeping on the couch. That, I know culture makes fun of that. You're gonna be sleeping on the couch tonight. Christians shouldn't. You shouldn't. You know what you guys should be doing? You should be staying up as long as it takes and talking through that stuff. You should be exercising forgiveness, love, patience, and mercy, even in your fights. And when you do, when you do, just know, you might get lucky, because it might not lead to Superb sex. It might lead to makeup sex, which, which is sometimes enjoyable as well. So stand up on your feet with me real quick. I hope this was valuable for you guys today. We were gonna have a prayer team come up at the end, but I'm gonna save that for next week. This is, so I, I, I wanna tell you a few things. The reason we don't have a prayer team is just because frankly, it's not prayer that you need right now, okay? You do need prayer sometimes. You know what you need? Conversations and time spent together. You don't need someone else praying for you. You need to pray with each other. Husbands, if you don't pray in front of your wife, that's a problem. It is a, it is a lack of spiritual maturity. You're supposed to be the leaders of your household. You're supposed to be the spiritual leaders. So if you can't do that with your wife, that is your issue. Y'all need to be praying together. You need to talk together. The response from this sermon is not a salvation call and it's not coming down here and asking someone else to pray for you. It's you getting in your car and having some hard conversations. It's you going on a date night and talking about some of this stuff and working through some of this stuff and committing to the process because it is going to be a process. But I, I do wanna say this. Husbands, if you don't plan on being here for next week's message or at least listening to it if you're out of town, then don't ever use anything that you heard today. Don't ever call back what you heard today and say, whoa, 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 well, Alex said, and the Bible said, if you're not gonna be here next week, you don't get to use anything that you heard this week, all right? So that's number one. Number two, for you parents that have teenagers that were in the room today, be very cautious with them this week. Be very intentional with their phone usage and their laptop usage, because this is a subject that we should be talking about. 
But just like you were immature and young when you were a teenager, they are too. And no matter whether it's a healthy topic or not, this may stir up thoughts and emotions and feelings. So be very careful with them this week. Make sure you keep a close eye on them. Keep some boundaries there with that. Love them in that way. And do this last thing for me today before we dismiss. If you're married in here, either put your arm around your spouse or hold their hand. Close your eyes. Close your eyes all of them. I wanna bless you. Lord, on behalf of all the couples in here, we ask you that you would teach us how to do better. Teach us what it looks like to live a marriage that displays a picture of you in the church. Teach us what it looks like to communicate, to be intentional, and to exercise patience. God, we pray even through your word, through how you interact with us, God, that you would grow us in this area. And I pray, I pray literally on behalf of our married people in here, God, that you teach us what it looks like to have a superb sex life. I pray that it would be better. I pray that it would be fulfilling and enjoyable and fun and exhilarating and everything that you've ever asked for. Lord, on behalf of our church, I pray that we cannot just be the church where people who have experienced divorce can come and find a safe place. I pray that we can be a church where people cannot go through a divorce. God, I pray, make us a church where couples who are struggling don't have to go through divorces because you show up and they respond to your word and they respond to your presence and your drawing. Help us get creative. Give strength where there needs to be strength. Give bravery where there needs to be bravery. Show up in these moments. Form us into the people and into the husbands and wives that you've intended for us to be. For anybody that's in here who's agreeing and praying for their spouse who's not here today, we call them home. God, we ask that you do a work in their life. We pray for salvation on account of them, that you'd open up their eyes and open up their ears to the gospel message, that you'd change their life, God, that you would become a priority in their life. And I thank you, God, that through their spouse, know that they're gonna see you and they're gonna understand your patience and your tender, loving care and your mercy and your kindness. Lord, we, I bless our people today. I thank you that you care about this subject that is near and dear to your heart. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 I love you guys.